Welcome to First Mondays in the Library at the New York Academy of Medicine. I'm Arlene Shainer, the Historical Collections Librarian at the Academy. Normally, I would be welcoming you to the library in person, but since we can't be together that way, I'll be sharing some highlights from our rare book collections with you in this virtual tour. The New York Academy of Medicine began building its library right after it was founded in January of 1847, and we have been open to anyone who wants to use the collection since 1878. The library has over 550,000 volumes, as well as all kinds of other materials, including archives, manuscripts, pamphlets, ephemera, and images. Everything in the collections is here because it tells us something about the history of health and medicine. We also have lots of digital content you can explore from anywhere. Visit us online to learn more about the library and explore our resources. Today we are going to talk about a few of my favorite books from the Margaret Barclay Wilson collection. People are often surprised to learn that the library has about 10,000 items related to food and cooking, but many of them are about the relationship between nutrition, cookery, and health. The collection arrived at the Academy in 1929, the gift of a fellow, Margaret Barclay Wilson. Born in Scotland, Wilson came to New York as a small child. She was the valedictorian of her class at Hunter College and became a tutor in the biology department after graduating. As her career advanced, she earned a medical degree from the Women's Medical College and Infirmary in 1893, which made it possible for her to establish a separate department of physiology and hygiene at Hunter, and then a department of home economics. Her collection complemented her love of classics and the Renaissance, as well as her interests in food economy, nutrition, and unusual foods. She provided expert advice about food economics and nutrition to New York City's health department during World War I and the 1918 flu epidemic. She also purchased many important early cookbooks, and we'll look at a few of those now. Cristoforo de Messis Bugo worked as a steward for the powerful Este family in Ferrara for more than 20 years, and this is his book on banquets, with recipes and information on kitchen equipment. We expect books like these to have illustrations to show us how finished dishes look and help us learn how to cook them, but most of these early texts had no pictures at all, and the recipes don't offer step-by-step -step instructions. This book provides a little peek into the world of fancy dining and cooking. Messis Bugo's book contains two illustrations. In the first one, an enthusiastic company of elegant diners enjoys a fancy meal, while the household's dogs and cat happily feast on the scraps that have been discarded on the floor around the table. The next illustration gives us just a taste of how much work it took to prepare one of these banquets. In this kitchen scene, braces of birds and baskets of vegetables hang from the rafters, while a cook on the left rolls out a sheet of pasta and the one in the center fills a platter with food from a large pan set over a fire. The two kitchen helpers roast meats on spits suspended from hooks attached to the giant pan's legs, while the little fellow in the front works a bellows to keep the fire burning at a steady rate. The first printed cookbook with lots of illustrations is Bartolomeo Scappi's Opera, which appeared in 1570 and was printed in many editions through 1643. Scappi is often described as an early celebrity chef. He cooked for several cardinals before becoming the cuoco secreto, or private cook, to popes, including Pius V, who is acknowledged right on the title page. Scappi's book was written to teach the aspiring professional everything about managing a large kitchen, from purchasing ingredients to planning and executing both elaborate feasts and simple meals. It included hundreds of menus and almost a thousand recipes, with a set of recipes especially for feeding people who were ill right at the end. But it's the pictures that really set Scappi apart from other contemporary books. Workspaces, furniture, utensils, pots, pans, and machinery all show up in the illustrations and provide us with visual documentation of what it was like to prepare food in a 16th century kitchen. The images were printed separately, and in our copy, they appear all together at the end of the book, rather than with the written commentary that describes them. Here we see a page with many kinds of knives, but also the first printed depictions of forks, and on the lower left, right below the knife sheath, a device for cutting pasta into ribbons. This kitchen space looks a bit like the one we saw in Mrs. Bugo, with a giant pot and spits for roasting meats on either side. 
Sometimes the whole enterprise was moved outside and set up as a field kitchen under a little tent. In the back, two pots are suspended from an iron bar, while a kitchen worker, who looks as if he's waving to us, roasts a joint of meat in front of the fire. Down in the foreground is another big pot, with birds roasting on spits suspended from the four legs of its stand, and on the ground, baskets holding all kinds of provisions. It took quite a bit of work to hoist these cauldrons on or off the fire and move them, as these four men with their wheeled cart and giant hooked pole are demonstrating. There are dedicated rooms for different kinds of food preparation. This space is the dairy. The man in the lower right churns butter, while the cook at the table whisks a custard, probably to make a blanc blanche, and someone, perhaps a supervisor, gazes down on him through the window above. In this combination storage and preparation room, we can see a sink with two faucets at the back, right behind the water well or pozzo, as well as cabinets to store plates, table linens, spices, and other expensive ingredients. Seven people are hard at work performing various tasks. The men at the middle table are making dough for pasta or pastry and rolling it out. Here we see another workspace, probably in a courtyard. At the back, a knife sharpener hones knives on a grinding stone, setting out on the table the sharpened implements that will be used to butcher meat and cut vegetables. Of course, someone always needs to do the dishes, and the man in front is hard at work doing just that. In this scene of the Cucina Principale, or the main kitchen, a worker tends the hearth at the back, shielding his face from the heat of the open flame, while the brick structure on the right with its smaller fires banked underneath allows for cooking at lower temperatures. The sink with faucets on the left supplies the room with running water. Scappi's book contains one elaborate fold-out illustration, and it tells part of the story of a real event. A parade of stewards, watched by Vatican guards, carries in hampers of hot and cold foods along with cases of beverages for the papal conclave that began on November 29, 1549, after the death of Pope Paul III. All the food is inspected by church officials before being placed on the revolving Lazy Susans behind them to make sure that none of the food has been adulterated and no secret hidden messages that might influence the outcome of the conclave are tucked inside. On the other side of the wall is the Sistine Chapel, where the cardinals are secluded while they choose the next pope, Julius III, who was not elected until February 8, 1550. Here are some of those specialized containers, the hinge top baskets for hot foods, the crates for carrying bottles, and the drawstring receptacles for the credenza, or cold foods. Summer is the ideal time to share this wonderful 18th century treatise by Monsieur Amy on making all kinds of frozen desserts. We don't know anything about the author of this book, aside from the fact that he was very clearly a professional, and his manual provides the precise instructions we expect in a book of recipes. The charming frontispiece shows cherubs hard at work making all kinds of frozen confections, while Hermes the messenger, with his winged feet and caduceus, transports a tray of ice cream treats to Zeus and Hera above. Amy begins his book by explaining that while ices and ice creams have been made for a long time, most of them are not very good. His, however, are perfect, and anyone can learn to make them by following directions. Not only are his instructions precise, he anticipates problems, explains how to solve them, and the illustrations show the equipment needed to make and serve these confections. On this page, we see a hand-cranked ice cream maker with its interior custard container, an outside bucket, along with a serving scoop and special serving goblets. And here are the whisk and bowl for stirring the custard, as well as all kinds of molds to make ice cream that looks like different kinds of cheeses or fruits like oranges or pears. Up at the top is the cave or freezer box. Made of two layers of metal with space for straw or another insulator in between, and drainage holes on the bottom, the icebox allowed the confectioner to make and mold his treats in advance, pack the rest of the interior with ice and salt, and know that the desserts would be perfect hours later when it was time to serve them. Amy made ices and ice creams using an astonishing range of flavorings, from vanilla and chocolate to coffee, nuts, spices, and of course fruit. 
He thought ice cream made from cashews conferred health benefits because the nut is shaped like a kidney. His favorite fruits were pineapples, which he called the king of fruits because of their flavor, and the crown of leaves on top, and strawberries, the queen. On the left is his description of the pineapple, and on the right, the recipe for strawberry ice cream. Of course, he insisted that the freshest and best ingredients were the most important part of ensuring a delicious result. I hope you enjoyed this short tour of a few of the treasures of our culinary collections. Remember that you can always learn more by visiting us at the library online.